Here's Rick Rubin's conversation with his friend Richard Russell from Shangri-La. When did we meet? Do you remember what year we met? I think I was out here meeting you in 91. Wow. And what year did you start the label? 89. Yes. So there was a record store in London called Groove Records in Soho in Greek Street. Soho in London used to be full of record stores. That was a fantastic grassroots scene, the kind of record store scene. So um, the, 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 yeah, there was the record stores, there was Groove Records, there was a guy called Tim Palmer, there was a producer called, there were two Tim Palmers, this is not the producer Tim Palmer, this is the record store owner Tim Palmer in London. Groove was the best shop, it was the smallest shop, it was tiny. They had, all the hip hop records used to come in from New York, they used to sell them in their dance records from Chicago and Detroit. Um, and it was, a, to me, that was a, a, a portal. Yes. Magic, mystical portal. How often did you go? I used to get the tube up there. I actually remember once when I was meant to be at synagogue on Yom Kippur, getting the tube up to Groove Records and feeling a fair bit of guilt. <laughs> That's what I was doing, Pat. That's what I was meant to be doing. 100%. Um, so Tim had Groove Records. He was selling huge amounts of certain imports and he was introduced to the idea of licensing in that if you were selling thousands of copies of one import 12 inch from new york you could potentially do a deal whereby you have the rights to press it yourself and that just makes more sense than importing of course and there was a, a burgeoning kind of cottage industry for labels in the UK licensing records from independence, yes. mostly in New York. Yes. And he was introduced by his brother to Martin Mills. And Martin had Beggar's Banquet, which was a label, the label of Gary Newman in the UK. Um, who I guess you would have been making records for not long after this, right? You would you'd have been making a cult record. Yes, right. That was the first album I ever produced. Ah. was the Cult Electric for Beggar's Banquet. First non hip hop album. It may have been the first first period, no. because I'd only done. I think I'd only done singles up till then. Ah, I can't remember if the Cult's Electric or if Hello Cool J's Radio came out first. I, I cannot remember. Mind you, you you are not the best historian of your own history. No. I've noticed this with you. No, I don't. Rem- I don't remember much. I but think I, it's very I, healthy. Yeah. Well, I don't look back at all. So. I, I, no, I've noticed that. I think it's healthy. I listened. There was a very funny moment. I don't know if you noticed how funny it was mm. in when you did one of these with T Bone Burnett, where I've not listened back, so I don't. So know. you talked about the. Um, but he was sitting right where you're sitting. Right. You talked about that, yeah, we're, we're sort of, this is like a self, a referential moment and we're oh, yeah. referencing back. Yes. I'm always referencing back to things. Um, there was a moment in the show where you talked about the wonderful Robert Plant and Alison Krauss record. Yes. I love that record. Spectacular. And you said to him, have you worked on any other records where you've got two unlikely people? Yes. And, you talk, and he said, have you ever done that? And you couldn't remember if you ever had done that. And then somewhat later in the show... He mentioned the Run DMC and Aerosmith record. Oh, yeah. And of course you had done that. Yes. And that's one of the most famous examples of that being done ever. Yeah. And you did that, but you can recall it in that minute. No, and I wouldn't, I, I, I don't think of it in that context, but right. yes, it does fit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That must help you, right, with your with what you do to not be bogged down in what you did before. I guess, I, I don't know. I don't think about it at all. So it's not a, it doesn't come into the, doesn't come into the uh, thinking at all. Mm. But it must be, there must be some philosophical reason for not looking back. Well, usually it just takes so long to make things. And, you know, if, if, if I listen as a fan, I may listen to something a thousand times, but probably not a thousand and one. You know, like there, there's a certain point where you've played it out mm. and you don't listen to it again for a long time. Mm. Anything I've worked on, I've listened to it enough for my whole life before anyone else has ever heard it, and I'm I'm good with it. And there's so much music to hear, and I love music. Why would I want to spend more time listening to things that I made when I can listen to things that other people made and maybe that I've never heard? Well, I could suggest a reason why you should do that. Tell me. Our sort of evolutionary paths as people, so much of it is about self-awareness. 
as people, right? Yes. So any therapy we do or whatever, we're kind of exploring stuff that happened. So I wonder if there's an argument that if by examining previous work we do and seeing what we did and seeing what happened, I think it is potentially, it can, I suppose it depends how the individual works, but I think that can be a way of learning things about ourselves now and for what we do. Like why we made the decisions we made when we made them. Yeah. I mean, I, I went to something called a pitch black playback where they take an album and they blindfold you and you sit in a black room and listen to that it. That sounds great. And they were doing an event for the album I'm New Here, I produced by Gil Scott Heron. Beautiful. And they invited me to go. Yes. And I, initially, I was like, well, I'm not going to go. I'm, you know, I'm not going to do that. And then I thought, hmm, it is 10 years ago I made that record. That was actually the first record of this era of record making for me. Yes. It's kind of, the, that was the start yes. of a 10 years, what's so far been 10 years of making records in an active studio based way. And I thought, oh, uh, I think I probably should do that. I mean, the record was only 29 minutes long. I thought, why not? So I went along and listened to it and it was extremely revealing. Yes. One thing I realized is that I've learned a lot about producing records since then. And whilst that might be helping me in some ways, I also think it's causing me to, that there's a risk of losing some of the spontaneity Absolutely. that was occurring then. And partly because I just didn't know what I was doing. Yes. I think it was helping me. Oh, for sure. That's true. That's true for everybody, by the way. That, right. that idea that when we start doing things, there's this naive energy where we may make some terrible mistakes, but very interesting things can happen. Mm -hmm. And then as we do it for a long time, we kind of learn our craft and we replace that naive energy with wisdom that we didn't have before. And we just make different things. It's not better or worse, but I don't know that you can put the genie back in the bottle. Do you know what I mean? I think it's just the, uh, I do a lot of things in my work to not know what's happening. <laughs> I trick myself in different ways to experience something as if it's the first time. Yes, I suppose. I, I've never quite articulated that. I do that as well. So how, give me an example of how you do that. When we're working on a project, I never take anything home with me. So I don't have the thought of listening to it. I try to work on different things at the same time because if, I'm, if I get completely absorbed in a different project, even for two hours, there's been this palate cleansing effect of working on something else and really focusing on it, that when I'm coming back, there is a little bit of a reset. So if there was something, if I was getting any tunnel vision before from working on it in a straight line for a long time, I might start losing perspective by working on something different. And it could even be by listening to other things. It happens sometimes with a band, like if we're working on a song and playing it over and over and over again, and it starts, it's, it starts sounding like they're not as interested in it. Like even though we're getting closer to the correct arrangement, you can see that the life of it's going away. I might say, hey, play a different song. You know, just play, play one of your favorite songs. And just shifting out of the mood of the song could be enough that when we come back to it, it has kind of a freshness again. Mm. That's extremely interesting and I think I've ended up adopting the opposite approach. And I do question it sometimes in that I've established this rule for myself of working incredibly strictly on one thing at a time and only one thing at a time. And I take stuff out of the studio and listen to it in all sorts of other places. Yes. And I get so immersed in the project and lost in it in some ways. I think I like being lost in it because it's almost like oblivion or something. Yes. I'm so sort of in it, yes. almost like when I'm in it when I'm asleep when I'm doing it. Yeah. But it's um, it's probably got its downsides. And I think one thing is that I think there's something about the taking out of music from the studio and listening to it that does have a slightly, can be stressful when you do that. And stress is never really helpful. There's something about that because it's like, you something you're in the middle of working on if you listen to that you you're really listening yes. i mean that's not like someone listening to a tune on the radio no and so because i take it with me i will do that at home yes and so suddenly 
you're working. You're, and still, you're, working you're still working on you're still, it. And you're working intensely yeah. hard. Yes. And, and you can't really take action on what you're working on no. because you're not in the studio, so you can't make the changes you're hearing. Yeah. And um, it's almost something that might make sense to do if you were in a tremendous rush to get something done, but I never am. So I slightly wonder why I've got into that. Okay, well, that's a very useful, uh, it's a useful thing to come out today. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to ponder that. And my theory in general is if you have a method that works for you, try something different. So that means for me, I, I'm going to try a project where I <laughs> just right. think about it all the time and see what happens. So yeah, when I, when I met you, I think it was shortly after we'd licensed Prodigy to Electra. And it actually might have been the other way around because I was, yeah, because I I didn't know if Prodigy was right for us because I knew we had the opportunity to do that, so it probably wasn't signed yet. Ah, oh, I, I think we talked about. Yeah, it could be. I don't even know if you had albums because I thought it was just twelve inches yeah, when could, we first. It, it, it could it could well have, it could well have been that, but um, you know the the Electra the Prodigy Electra deal was short lived. Oh, so then maybe it was. Yeah, maybe that's right. It was that we got you know, signed and dropped really quickly. Yeah, so that might have been. It was that that experience of kind of walking into like a corporate American kind of shiny record company, everyone being really pleased to see you. Mm. And then like smash cut to like the record's not a hit. Yes. <laughs> no one's returning your even, calls. Yeah, they don't even take your calls. <laughs> and yes. it's like and, and I do think it's one of the one of the things I've identified as the the sort of the, the shortcomings of if you have to deal with corporations, is like there's these there's these modes of dealing with you whereby if you're like the object of desire or you're someone who's generating money for them, like you can, they'll kind of treat you a bit like a God. But if you're like not of interest, they'll sort of treat you like nothing. Yes. And really uh, the, 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 the correct way of dealing with someone is neither of those things. Yes. It's, it's just to deal with a person as a person. Both, both are unhealthy and neither of them support the best artistic work mm. um those experiences though with the uh, licensing records to u.s majors which we did throughout the 90s and into um the 2000s although i was seeing a fair amount of stuff out here where i was like you know i was thinking that doesn't that doesn't seem that great what's going on. I was also seeing this whole kind of ambitious way of looking at gay music out there. Yes. It's kind of unique to America. Yes. And I do think I took some of that back with me. Yes. And I think uh, I sort of developed this idea that that was really not, it wasn't anything new about it. It was a combination of, of existing things where I was like, independent record labels are often especially the, the classic ones in the UK, they're often got really integrity, yes. musical integrity, artistic sensitivity. Yes. Genuine respect and support for the artists. Um, that's, that was their big advantage. Majors had drive, ambition. They were competitive. Uh, they wanted to get the music to the biggest possible audience. Those were like the respective strengths. Yes. And then there were respective weaknesses. And I just had this sort of, it was almost like an epiphany of like, well, why can't we just be both of those things? Yes. The sensitivity of an independent yes. and the integrity of it and the drive of a major. And the next thing I thought was, there must be a reason people don't do that. And there must be some part of the formula. There must be. And the thing that struck me was hardly put any records out because otherwise it's not going to be possible. It's going to be, there's not, you know, you're not going to have the, ma the manpower or the funds yes. to do that a lot, but you could do that a bit. And so then it was like, okay, but then it needs to be, there needs to be real heart and soul in what these things are. Absolutely. And what we do. And even in the most sort of overtly mainstream thing we've ever done, which is Adele. Yes. I think she's got that. Yes. Because it's in her. She's not. Yes, if you've met her, she's got it. She's not sweetness and light. <laughs> no. That's not how she is. She's telling it like it is, yes. you know. Yes. And the joke I made after I first met her to Jonathan, who's her manager, was I said, I think she's a punk Barbara Streisand. Uh, she is. And she is. And it's like, I don't think anyone else has ever combined punk and Barbara Streisand. No. 
So again, <laughs> it's like a mixture. That's what's of, fascinating about it. Now, I don't know what her. I don't know what her take is. I'll, I'll ask. Her, I don't know what her take is on that. <laughs> that idea that that's what she. I don't know how she feels about punk music, but unquestionably, she's got that ability to say, mm, "Fuck that, we're moving on." And it's such a big part of her, her, her building what she what, what she's built. So I think that kind of character. I'm very drawn to that kind of character. You know the the sort of. It's characters who, who are often seen by people as difficult, but they're yes. not really difficult. They're yeah. only difficult if you're sort of trying to like mess with them and, and stop them doing what they know they should be doing. Yes. But actually working with that type of character, it's, the, it's really the easiest thing, isn't it, if, you, if you're a believer? Yeah, because they know what they're doing and you, you support what they do. They're, not try- it's, they're only difficult because people are trying to get them to do something that they, don't, that they know is not right for them to do. Yeah, and then it's God help you. Exactly. God help you, know, exactly. trying to do that. Yeah. So I, I think those, you know, those type of characters, I always, and I always get a sort of, you know, Jack White is that type of character. Yes. Damon Albarn is that type of well, character. Who was the first artist? So it started as a dance label. Mm-hmm. Would, would you call it a dance label? What would you describe the early XL? A rave label. Rave label. A rave label, yeah. Okay. So yeah. it was... Elect- was it all programmed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So pro- I don't think I don't think there was a live instrument on one of our okay. records. So for- program-based electronic music. It would be the precursors of EDM. It's, could we say that? Well, mm. what is it the precursor of, mm. or is it? Mm. I mean, EDM to me was a bit like if you had hippie parents and they had a child who became an investment banker, and they were sort of looking on aghast. That's how I felt about ADM. Okay, but so so then it is. Then it is what I. <laughs> that is what I mean. So it 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 was the. That's how the blues guys probably felt hearing Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Possibly there was a. The, I I think there was a. There was a materialism. It was the sort of Las Vegas. Yes. Materialistic aspect of it that seemed felt to me direct. But I don't think that that made that's. That's about the culture of it, but the music, I don't think the music was made with Las Vegas in mind. Oh, no, that's probably true. Yeah, that's that's probably fair. I mean, that the rave scene in the UK was, you know, I've been, I've been traveling back a little bit recently because Keith Flint passed away mm. from Prodigy yes. very recently. Yes. And so that's led to us just talking about that period which we yes. haven't really talked about a lot I and mean, you know it was an amazing amazing time and yes. um i think when you're in it you're just in it aren't you you're just doing it um i it, i had the same experience here going to raves that i had going to the early hip-hop clubs it was the same feeling it was the same energy and excitement hmm. yeah so the, the i mean the early parties are at home where there was a combination. I mean, it was one thing that was interesting was it got the, the, the outdoor events, the unlicensed outdoor events. Yeah. Um, they were really big. There were thousands of people, but it was something that just started existing. So very quickly, it was just this sort of, I suppose, you know, now people, you talk about something going viral. That was that was the viral pre pre viral viral. Yeah, and it's obviously always been possible for things to go viral. I suppose yes. the internet is just a, a, a means of that occurring. Amplifier, maybe, yeah, amplifier. Yeah. So you know, we'd be at those events, and they they were quite a spectacle. Those events because there were thousands of thousands of people, yeah. and you know, dancing to music that was mostly from Chicago and Detroit, and then you know, we started making these records where we were kind of taking that sound and of course a lot of that sound was like a european synthesizer influence sound so there'd already been such a great dialogue forth. it's beautiful Absolutely. isn't it so there's you know they're being influenced by like european dance records they're making these more soulful techno records mm-hmm. and we were all frustrated b-boys we wanted to be making records like you made yes you know that's what we want and it just did we all did and no one liked them yes. you know we all made British Hip Hop records. Liam was in a group called Cut to Kill. You know, I used to work with this MC called Lord JT. I mean, we really tried to do that, but no one was really interested. Yeah. And then when we used those uh, break beats yeah. and sped them up on the wrong speed, added them to the the, the techno sounds, and we, you know, we we were making this this breakbeat rave sound, this hardcore breakbeat rave sound. Suddenly, 
everyone wanted to know about it. I made that song, The Bouncer, in an hour, and it was a top 10 pop record. I mean, it was insane, but it was they weren't on the radio, but the movement was so big. The grassroots movement was so big. If you had a song that was big in those parties, big on pirate radio, so many people would go out and buy the 12-inch, you'd find yourself. And so, I've, you know, I was on top of the pops. How did this happen? <laughs> you know, miming on my synth. You know, we were making records to DJ with. That was, that was the only aim, and you couldn't really get it wrong. And the records we were putting out, so we were making records and we were, we were putting out other people's records, but they, would, they were for our DJ set, and we'd, they, you couldn't get that wrong. But there was a weakness in that approach, I worked out in retrospect, which was I got the first thing Aphex Twin ever made, and I remember thinking, it's kind of interesting. I can't work out how I get this in my DJ set, though. I can't work out where this fits. Yes. And I kind of put it on the shelf, literally on a shelf where I used to sort my records out because he put out a white label. Yeah. And I got it from Zoom Records in Camden. I tried to get it in my set. I was like, I can't get this in my set. I knew there was something interesting with it, but it was like concentrating. It, didn't, it didn't fit the framework. Exactly. Which was a limited framework. Exactly. Understood. And so I think the next phase for the label was like, well, let's now work with some things which don't fit. And what was the first don't fit? Um, there was a guy called Badly Drawn Boy who was yes, from Manchester. Fantastic. Yeah, so his debut was really, really very, very good record. Yes, well, you know there was a there was a ground, a sort of DJ ground there, in that he was working with a guy called Andy Votel, who was like a kind of digger mm-hmm. in Manchester, mm-hmm. and they had a label called Twisted Nerve. So they had their little kind of scene going there, their their culture, and Andy was into like kraut rock soundtrack movie old you know italian soundtracks he was a beathead um he did the artwork he played an important part so it wasn't like completely removed um but it was definitely a leap somewhere different to someone who was clearly an album artist a, a live artist i mean we had one artist called sl2 which was in the early which was two djs called slip matt and lime and they had couple of huge rave singles they were monsters these songs and i remember when i tried to discuss making an album with them they were absolutely not going to make an album and the reason for that was they said well if we, the songs we record at the start by the time we get to the end of recording they're old and this is dj music i like this this i'm making this and it goes out now it's just current absolutely yes so they they were kind of not making an album as an ultimate statement of sort of dj uh solidarity or something it was amazing so there's no sl2 album and you realize because if you don't make an album you do slightly slip off of historical absolutely a bit and you know and it's funny because in the early days of hip-hop i never would have guessed there would ever be hip-hop albums i thought for sure that it was going to remain this this 12-inch format. And it was my partner who said, no, we're going to make albums. Like, how can you make an album? That's not what this is. Um, mm. So it's interesting. Mm. I, could, I completely understand the perspective of... And and my, my reason was different. It wasn't necessarily the immediacy of it. It was just that the format of these... Of a long track on one side and then maybe an instrumental or a variation on it on the B side. And it, and it, it really did function in a way where if you were a DJ, you needed all that stuff. So if you put that on an album, it won't be a good album. If you put all those, those DJ tools on the album, it's not so good. I, you know, I, I've returned to that kind of 86 era hip hop. Not, not, and I, I, it's not nostalgia this, I think it's very inspiring. Yes. There's something still very inspiring in it for me. I've also been listening to a lot of, you know, that kind of kraut rock, that sort of German progressive stuff of the yes, 70s. fantastic. And I don't know, there's something about both of those types of music for me, which just feel there's a kind of rawness and a spontaneity going yes. on there. And I, there's, yeah, I've got, I suppose, you know, they've got the drums in common, a lot of it, but there's a, yeah, I've got a, a, a deep abiding love for that for that era of music that just hasn't yes. gone anywhere well it, it again it's like listening to the beatles it's like it defines it defines a style of music mm. and the music that's made since in hip-hop is really different than that 
I wouldn't say it's worse or no, better. I wouldn't either. It's just different. Yes. Um, and if you want that, that's where you go to get it. It's like there's there isn't anything else that's specifically that flavor. Yeah, yeah. But it feels to me like there's maybe. I mean, I guess this is why hip hop has maintained its rele- relevance. Is I think it's to do with a lack of deference to what went before. Yes. And I think that's really healthy. Yes. You know? And I don't think. See, one thing I started noticing with with rock bands. It's a little while ago. None of them, when I was when I was talking to like band new bands, there was a moment where I thought none of these bands think they're going to be better than the Beatles or even the Stones. Yes. They don't think that. Yes. Now, rappers and R&B artists are in no way looking at the people who went before them and saying, "I'm not going to be better than them." That's true. And that puts you in a completely, I mean, because really, if you're, if you're saying I'm not going to be better than something that happened 50 years ago, yes. I would argue you're a little bit screwed. And I think what we're seeing there is, you know, whereas what we're seeing in, in rap and R&B, I mean, I was thinking, you know, who's the greatest female R&B vocalist of all time? One strong argument is that it's Beyonce. Yes. And that's happening right now. So we are in the sort of, peak and maybe there's more peaks but we're definitely not going down um i don't think she would tell you that she's better than aretha franklin no no absolutely i understand that uh but she's occupying a very very different space in culture culture, and in commercial terms yes staggeringly different yes because my understanding is that aretha was not competing with the biggest commercial things of her of her era depends in different moments she did okay um as a rule, not always the case. Yeah, and 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 you know, Beyonce, f- that feels like an artist where, on a sort of creative level, on a commercial level, things are at such a kind of high that that affects everything in its genre, doesn't yes. it? Yes, everything is kind of higher because of that. And yeah, and rap artists, they just they just don't have. De- I mean, it's amazing with like the British thing. No current British rapper knows any British rap. In the past, and they are moving forward. That seems great. It's that what's seems happening really healthy. right now. That's great. After badly drawn boy, who was the next in the? Uh... Well, I think then we kind of hit our stride, like something was sort of unlocked then. So there was like a run where we worked with completely different artists, and like basically we we got to do the opposite of what we did in the first place, which is what I really wanted. Because yeah. no question, those scenes, scenes are a great place to start. But, you know, what starts as the platform kind of becomes the jail, you know, and you get typecast really easily. Yes. Um, so we were doing, in fairly quick succession, um, Dizzy Rascal, who was a very, very significant game-changing artist in the UK. Absolutely. In terms of he was the star. Yes. He made the defining masterpiece of yes. Crime. Yes. The, the Boy in the Corner album. Astonishing album. And there was something going on there where I was like, because Badly Drawn Boy had won this thing, the Mercury Prize in the UK, which had really helped him. Mm-hmm. But Dizzy was a British rapper. British rap was a dirty, dirty word. Yes. But he had made a masterpiece. I knew he was making a masterpiece. And I felt like, what? this artist needs is something like that. Yes. And I remember actually putting them under time pressure and saying, this should be submitted. I mean, yeah, they might totally ignore it, but this needs to be submitted to that thing. And he ended up winning that prize. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. And it was a huge thing, I think, for this world where he was coming from of pirate radio, of proper street music in the UK. Um. And he was. Oh, the, tell tell people about the Mercury Prize because many people in the in the in America don't know about that. Well, it's a very healthy thing. I mean, obviously, we we all have to be a bit circumspect about awards. Yes, because it's not it's not a reason to be doing things. But the Mercury Prize, they basically say every year they say these are the ten best uh, British albums this year. They name the ten records. Yes, all of the records kind of win. Yes, and it's and it's 
always by a first album artist? No, it's or not it debuts. Have to be? It's not debuts. It's just British records. No, so but it, I'm saying, does it have to be their first album? No, no, or it could be. It no. could be any from any point in their career. Oh, I yeah, didn't so, know that. I always think of it as new artists. So when Skepta won a couple of years ago, yes. um, so, so they, they named 10 records, yes. but then one is named as well. On the night, they have a panel and they're yes. in a room yes. and they argue about it on the night in some secretive way. Mm-hmm. And then they come out and say, this one's the winner. So obviously it's always a bit controversial, yes. but then that's fine. You know, that it makes people talk about albums. Absolutely. So the year that Skepta won, the other most, uh, the, the other the, the argument that evening, I was told obviously was between should the Skepta album win or should that final David Bowie album, Black Star, mm-hmm. win? And that's just a really healthy Absolutely. sort of, sort of um, dialogue. And my own record, which is called Everything Is Recorded, yes. got nominated, was in it last year. Oh, great. So that was great. And we performed, you know, I got everyone who was on the record and we all, great. you know, so that was a, that was an exciting thing. But I think it was, it was seismic for Dizzy and for yes. Grime. Yes, because because it was it was shedding a light on something that people were brushing under the rug. Absolutely, yeah. and the you know it was in the in the raves and in the you know it was it was bubbling. There was stuff going on. Yes, but it needed um, it needed something like that. Yes. So yeah, that was that was kind of seismic. So there was there was dizzy. Um, there was the white stripes. You know, I st- still work with Jack. Yes. Why? And so that was a very, very interesting thing of like, they were, you know, they were some way into it already to what they were doing because they've been putting albums out over here. Mm-hmm. But I think somehow people had sort of bracketed them as like a blues act, a sort of odd blues act. Yes. And kind of like initially there was a feeling about the White Stripes because they had two albums out of like, we just, don't need to bother with this for some reason. Mm-hmm. And, but, and then there was just that moment where things seemed to kind of click. Yes. And suddenly people were seeing how exciting this and unique this potentially was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Jack's one of these polymath figures. He's very unusual, you know, to have all these abilities of virtuoso, guitarist, vocalist, writer, producer, does the artwork, you know, was a furniture maker. Yes. You know, like almost like a prince like yes. spread. So yeah, White Stripes was like it was they were very, very successful um in the UK. We didn't put their records out in America. Um but they were really like a sort of um they just caught on in a huge way, doing something really original. Mm-hmm. Um and outside of the mainstream that became the mainstream. Yes. And then there's this amazing sort of Seven Nation Army thing yes. where this has become like, I, I actually wonder if that is now the biggest guitar riff of all time. It, I know that's a big claim, but... It's up there. I mean, there, it, right? it, you you hear it everywhere. Mm. You hear, you hear, I don't even mean the song, I mean you, you people sing the guitar riff mm. everywhere. Mm. Yeah, I mean, because it became this huge sports thing all around the world. Yes, um, where soccer fans sing that riff. Yes. I'd say it was definitely the last great guitar riff. Probably so. Not to say there'll never be another one. No, no. But since. Yeah. Um, so, and then MIA, where, you know, this was, Maya was an artist who people really could not get their head around in the UK. But we always kind of had a feeling that here, somehow and there was an you know i'd had these experiences of coming out here and licensing records to people and we did her record with interscope out here and that it was pretty helpful yeah you know to sort of help really show people it and working with diplo this was the first thing diplo did Mm -hmm. so actually i think diplo and maya was a bit of a two alphas combination like that wasn't going to last forever but it was fireworks yes what it did it was really great you know and they both had a sort of similar um, approach to like a bit of the clash, mm. a bit of dancehall, yes. you know, a bit of Brazilian music, mm-hmm. um, and that was this. This yeah, it was very very exciting. And then so th- then we were sort of into this other phase where I was wanting to get back in the studio, and I made this record with Gil Scott Heron. So then this so this started a kind of other sort of another lane open yes um 
And I'm back in the studio and I'm making a record with Girl and this leads to making a record with Bobby Womack and then a Damon Albarn solo record. And, um, the did late... you know that Gil was going to be the first one? Like, did, did you, how did it work out that Gil was the first one you chose to do? So I was, um, you know, Liam from Prodigy, he was always very good at saying to me, are you making beats? Are you making records? And you were, you used to say that to me as well. Yeah. And I really because I know you really like it. Yeah, because I love it. I love doing that. <laughs> no. I really no. And when I didn't do it, it really wasn't good for me. No, personally, I mean, you yes. know, I mean, I think the label got some benefit from like me being hundred percent focused Absolutely. on it for a while, and that was good. Yes. Um. So it wasn't like I wasn't being constructive in that time, but I think what happened was in that time I built something. Yes. And I also and, and I and I populated populated it with really great people, and I I think at the time I didn't even know why. I felt we needed, I needed such great people there, but I knew I did. Yes. And then, so Liam had said to me, have you got a laptop, an Apple laptop with reason on it? You're going to like this. This is good beat making stuff. Yes. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. This is sort of interesting. So I got the laptop and I learned how to use reason and that led into me learning how to use logic. And suddenly I was like making hundreds and hundreds of beats. I was spending all my time doing it. Great. Really loving it. These like very sort of clunky sample based things because I was listening to a lot of grime and making all these like fun little things in headphones, all like obsessed like a teenager with yes. it. And um, then Kanye uh, had a song on his second album called My Way Home, which was sampling uh, Gil's Home is Where the Hatred Is with common rapping over it. And I remember hearing it and thinking, I want to hear a new Girls Go Home record. I'm going to make a new Girls Go Home record. Incredible. That's how it's got to work. So, and almost straight away, I started putting songs together because I thought, well, I, 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 he's probably not been writing. Before you even reached out to Before him. Before anything. Amazing. I thought, I'll start putting the songs together. Yes. Why not? Arm myself with that. Yes. And then when I was listening for songs for him, I was so alive to the music. I was hearing it. It was like hearing music for the first time. Yes. And then I managed to get in touch. That's with a him. really interesting point is that when you're listening to music for a particular project, you listen to it beyond the excitement of it. You listen in a different way. Like Absolutely. the parameters are different. Yes. Fascinating. And this is why I think a lot of times people lose their excitement and connection to music is because they're not listening to it like they were when they were a teenager. Yes. They haven't got the newness. Yes. And the excitement. Yes. I think if you've got a reason, now I think if that reason is you're trying to have hits and make a buck, that won't work. I agree. That doesn't that doesn't have but if you've got whatever the reason is you're trying to find a cover for someone yes. or you've got a theme in mind to explore and you want to play someone some references, wow, you're so open. And also I, I what I find happens then is it leads me into new things. I'm, and when I say new, either newly recorded or old but new to me, because there's yes. a whole world of that out there still. Yes. And I'm discovering things that to other people are like the most important music of their lifetime. Yes. I'm just hearing it now. Yeah. And yeah. so much fun hearing music that you've not heard before and you're looking for a particular thing for a particular reason and went just that deep dive in that vicinity Mm. is super fun and we get to learn so much about music through the process mm. amazing yeah it is it, it is amazing and Gil was um Gil was incarcerated at the time so we started writing letters to each other wow and he's a i mean i like i like writing letters i like writing yes and um he was a amazing letter writer and we used to write these nice letters to each other and i was kind of saying i've got this idea and he was like well mm but we were kind of writing letters to each other. And then I went and visited him uh, in Rikers Island. Wow. And what I was had, he in prison for? Possession. Oh. It's, I mean, yeah. in, insane, really. Yeah. You know, this is a... It's political, isn't it? I mean, three strikes and you're out kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Possession of coke. I mean, I would argue there is nothing sort of ethically or morally any more wrong with that than possession of a bottle of gin. Mm-hmm. And there you are in jail. Um, and uh, when I went to see him, 
he said, first thing he said to me was, there you are. And it was like, yeah, I don't know. It's like he was expecting me to turn up in some slightly deeper way. Well, I'm not exactly sure what I made, but there was something about it. Yes. There was something about um, this sort of com- very free conversation I had with him. And I thought they'd have a very strict sort of thing there about like, right, you're done now. But they just didn't really seem that bothered. Great. So we were just sitting there having this conversation. And it somehow felt very light. It was like a very light energy. Yes. Although we were in this this yes. insane we were in it. It's like hell, isn't it? Yes. And yet it seemed light. And at one point I said to him, You don't I've noticed you haven't complained about anything in this conversation. Because I was slightly surprised by that, because I thought, you know. And he said, um, if you complain, no one wants to hang out with you. I kind of took that with me. Yeah. And he he did have a, he had an immense amount of very deep and resonant wisdom. Beautiful. And that he was happy to share. And in terms of making a record, he was like, he was pretty nonchalant about it. You know, he'd had one of those runs of records like the Beatles or Bowie, you know, Beatles in the 60s or Bowie in the 70s. He had that in the 70s. You know, he made 13 records in like it was 10 years. Um, He was never a huge commercial artist. It had a massive amount of impact, lasting impact. Um, The kind of between the the politics and the jazz and the jazz aspects of it. You know, it's very resonant in music now. I think Oscar Heron. He's very resonant, very present um, in music. And he was, he saw I really wanted to make a record with him. And he was like, all right. Great. Okay. Great. Let's try it. See what happens. So. And how long had it been since his last album? Well, so he did all these records up until 82. Mm -hmm. Then he didn't make another record until one in the 90s called Spirits, which is actually really pretty good on TVT. 97 ish and then no records until this one so he you know and people had suggested things to him and he just didn't fancy it he was performing live though he was active live all the way through he saw that as more his job yes. was to, to perform live yes and when people used to ask him when have you got a new record coming he would say have you heard all my old records because if not there's a new one for you there yes Good answer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a fair point. And, and it is quite a catalogue to study, his catalogue. There's a lot of very, very interesting stuff in there. Still reveals itself to me, actually. Mm. Especially if you do the vinyl listening with it, because there's all the sleeve notes and stuff. He used to write a lot of sleeve notes, and there's a lot of very... You know, he used to talk about the environment a lot mm. in the early 70s, mm. which, you know, you really think, wow, people were onto this 50 years ago. Like, how is it that this has happened? you know, that we've got here and we're kind of just getting alive to it. Yes. Because, um, you know, winter in America, I mean, winter in America sounds like it's about now. Yeah. So prescient, un- unbelievable, really. Um, so when he got out, we started recording initially in what was Philip Glass's studio, Looking Glass. Mm-hmm. You ever worked there? Mm-mm. It was nice. In Soho. Mm-hmm. Um. And then it closed. I guess it was that era of studios closing. Yes. Uh, and then we moved to Clinton in Hell's Kitchen. Mm-hmm. And that was good. And I would come out to New York and record him. Um, and then I'd go home. I had a st- Clinton's not there anymore either. No, no Clinton's gone. No. It's like the doors were closing behind us everywhere we left yeah. as, we, as we as we went like, yes. like, oh, we'll be back. I'll come back in a month. Yes. And it was gone. Yes. It was a very interesting phase of like something old phasing out and I guess some new things coming in um but i would go home and work on it and also what i was doing was i was presenting him with material a lot of which was his material because i had his old poetry books beautiful and i was suggesting parts that i thought might be relevant for the piece we were making beautiful and he would do a great idea yeah it worked really well Great. and he was doing readings of stuff so like the intro and outro of the uh, album we made 
It's called On Coming From A Broken Home, part one, and On Coming From A Broken Home, part two. That was a poem that was in, that was a long piece, a long poem that was in his poetry book, which was called Small Talk at 125th and Lennox, same as, same as his first album was called, that came out in 1970. This is stuff he'd written when he was 20. But it felt so alive to me on the page. Um, so I would like edit bits out and say, what do you think of that? And he'd go, yeah, that bit, but actually there's another bit. And he'd pull some more stuff out. And then I would sometimes, I'd, I'd take him like little musical sketches I'd made. And we had this word, Spartan. I suggested we made a record that was quite Spartan. And he used to then pull me up using that word. Because when I played him stuff, that I, so I would take home and work on it in my studio at home in the basement. Completely How would you describe own. Spartan? Um containing nothing that is not absolutely necessary. Okay. Just the minimum. Yes. Um, and I, I think I found, I found early hip hop records to be that. Yes. Right. That's what. That's my, that's my mission in life. Right. Spartan. So I would occasionally play him things and he would say, what about Spartan? Because I'd have done a bit too much. So he was kind of, yeah. he was A&R and me. Yes. As well. And I've been making all this stuff. And so I was like, you know, he, he, he sort of freed me up. He'd given me permission to like make music properly. Beautiful. You know, and kind of get it. I mean, I was making music already, but I was in the dark yes. on my own. Yes. And he was kind of saying, let's do it together. Yes. And also what was quite interesting was he said, um, I took a photo of him one day and I said, uh, I think that's a, I think that's a, that's like a, that's a cover shot. And um, he said, where are you? And I said, well, I'm not on the cover. And he said, well, it's going to be strange though, isn't it? When people see the name Gil Scott Heron and Richard Russell, but they only see me. Don't you think that's going to confuse them? And I was like, yeah, it's not going to say that on it though. It will say Gil Scott Heron. And he said, oh no, we've made this together. Why would you not have your name on it? That's what I do. And he referred me back to his albums he used to make with Brian Jackson. Yes. They are all billed to Gilscott Heron and Brian Jackson. Wow. And I remember the feeling I got when he suggested it was actually terror. Yes. <laughs> I just thought, I'm doing that? Yeah. You're Gilscott Heron. Yes. I'm not putting my name. But of course, actually, what he was suggesting was, in, it was, well, it was very generous, but it was also entirely logical and reasonable. Mm -hmm. The other thing was that he was, he was, in, he really wanted there to be photos of everyone who's involved in the record, yeah. in the artwork, which we ended up not doing. I don't really believe in regret, but that, I, you know, I sh that should have happened because he did suggest it and for some reason it didn't happen. But he was like the engineer, yes. the guy who played guitar on the song I'm new here. Um, all these people should be, they should be pictured. And that is a lovely, you know, way of looking at it. I can remember we were recording one of the later Johnny Cash albums and we were doing a song that he suggested called We'll Meet Again. And um, he insisted that everyone who worked on the project sing on the choruses, we'll meet again. And he wanted everybody's voice to be with his. And, um, and I think he was thinking it was his last album. Right. So I and, guess that's similar. In and that. was it his last album? I don't know if it was his last album, but it was near the end. I mean, I did start to wonder if there was something, because I've ended up making two records for people where it was their last records. Yes. And I did start to wonder if the, so if you look at an artist making their debut, there's an urgency there. Yes. I wondered if that might apply if you're making your last record. It may. And I, I'm sure some part of you would know. Right? I'm sure. Some part of you would know it was sure. your last record. I'm sure. Um, and, you know, that Bowie Blackstar record, I suppose yes. that's the most overt yes. one where it, se it seems like he very specifically knew. Yes, the last Leonard Cohen album as well. Right. And I think that's very valuable. I mean, there's obviously a lot of taboo around death, you know, in the West, and it's very counterproductive, that. Mm. But I think, you know, maybe you ushered in an era where 
you know, it's like the late career masterpiece and it's a great thing. Yes. Because, you know, the, the sort of old fashioned music business idea of like you're washed up, yes. you know, it's terrible. Yes. To the idea that people are like when they're past their commercial peak, yes. we haven't got anything to hear from them. It's ridiculous. And it, I think it's always applied worse in music than in other fields. You know, now, you, know, you don't want the movie director to be in his 20s. I mean, it might be right, might be great, but you definitely like, you're not going to rule them out because they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or painters or writers. So I feel like that's the kind of area now where, like you say, no to 20 year olds are the same. Yeah. No to 70 year olds are the same. It's true. And so, you know, we can hear a great record from someone of any age. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was one of the best things um, about the success of the Johnny Cash records we did were. were I had other, I'll call them grown up artists coming to me saying, I feel like I have permission to make something good now. Before I, I wouldn't have even tried. It's a great thing. And I think that in hip hop, I, I would imagine that that last Jay-Z record is gonna give people a bit of permission to think, oh, I can grow older in rap. Yes. Because I think that's a fantastic record, that yes. 444, it's mm -hmm. brilliant. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I mean, he wasn't even 50 when he made it. So of course, why shouldn't you yes. make a great record? But that, I would imagine that's the first time that's happened. For sure. Right. But not the last. Richard Russell's book, Liberation Through Hearing, is out now. You should also check out his album, Friday Forever, under the moniker, Everything is Recorded. You can check out a playlist of some of our favorite songs on XL on our website, brokenrecordpodcast.com. And while you're there, sign up for a behind-the-scenes newsletter. Broken Record is produced with help from Jason Gambrell, Mia Lobel, and Leah Rose. Our theme music is by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. Thanks for listening.